Welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter. I am your host. Richter! What? Leave him alone! This shit is real. Now we got Richter go and we're going to have to hear it about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bunch of screaming memes out there and that's the scoop that has been reported so far. Thanks for dropping me like a snub. I'm not interested in believing in something. Either it's real or it's not. By your opinion that you are no-kill, you are dooming the species to be extinct. They are what they are. It doesn't matter what we call them. Let's remove ourselves from them a little bit. And I think that's something that the Bigfoot community can actually learn a little bit from. I actually am trying to push the envelope of science here. When are we going to make a video, Richter? And I mean not an X-rated one. Dr. Todd, you've also been called the scoff dick. <laughs> yeah, well, have these creatures stood against a backdrop of trees, I probably never would have seen them. You can't talk about I can. So you guys are going to bag a Bigfoot and get us a body. We're giving it uh, our best efforts. We thought that we had the holy grail of DNA. Our hero, Bob Gimlin, is with us. Hello, is this thing on? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Hey, Richter, I've got a question for you. How does it feel to lose Bigfoot Bounty? Hmm. My question is, why do you think Bigfoot is real? Richter does put a lot of effort into his costuming, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, by effort, if you mean bending over and picking up whatever's on the floor. My! Well, in my opinion, After Hours with Richter is the number one Bigfoot webcast. Uh, what's your name again? Oh. Don't piss Richter off. <laughs> hey, welcome to After Hours with Richter, the number one Bigfoot webcast. I'm here with my co-host, Richter Riolo. <laughs> I've been downgraded. Oh my gosh. All right, we'll play that. Go on. Uh, you might know me from SweetSassyGlassy.com. <laughs> We're here with Lauren Coleman, and uh, this is a epic moment for us on After Hours. We've got a legendary person here to interview, and let's start. Well, what's this here? Oh, we have a book. What's we the have book? A book? The book is Bigfoot, The True Story of Apes in America by Lauren Coleman, author of Mysterious America. Buy it. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Lauren. Well, it's good to be here out in the woods with you. That's right. You couldn't be in more safer hands. Because Tammy has guns. <laughs> well, they don't call them guns. What do you call them? Uh, the girls. The girls. <laughs> All right. Lauren, you also uh, run a museum, a crypto museum in Maine. Right. Let's yeah. Tell us about it so people can come visit. Okay. It's the International Cryptozoology Museum. It's in Portland, Maine. And it's existed for 12 years. has uh, 10,000 artifacts in it spread over a few rooms and uh, we have things like the Tom Slick donated material, uh, the real hair sample from Sir Edmund Hillary's expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Page from Ohio donated his whole collection including the Patterson files that were related to the contracts that he had, a dart gun they used to try to get the first Bigfoot. Really? In 1969, yeah. So there's all kinds of different artifacts uh, on uh, Yeti, Bigfoot, sea serpents, lake monsters, chupacabras. Well, what first got you interested in crypto and Bigfoot and paranormal? Well, it all started in March of 1960. I saw this movie called Half Human, a Japanese film that had been kind of redone and redesigned to mm -hmm. be uh, for Americans. and. I went to school the next day, and actually what occurred was I said, what is all, what's this about the Yetis? Mm -hmm. And my teacher said three things. Uh, get back to your homework. Quack. Leave me alone. Quack. They don't exist. Quack. So, of course, that stimulated me to look deeper and deeper into it. Okay. I started reading books. I started corresponding with people like Bernard Hoibelman, Ivan Sanderson. I had 400 correspondents in the first year started writing articles, you know, once you write articles, then it's easy to put them together in a book. Mm -hmm. And then once that happens, uh, TV companies and uh, other people started calling me up. Uh, I went to one of my first conferences in 1973, and uh, one of the leaders of the conference came over to me, and I was giving a talk there. 
He said, oh my gosh, I thought you were in your 40s. I was only in my 20s. So. Mm, it's wow. just, I, I was one of so those. you're pretty mature for your age. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, I had if, done I mean, a you, lot. if you thought you were in your 40s, right. and you were really in your 20s, they that, thought that says was, a lot. Yeah, I'd been doing a lot of research. I'd certainly been doing mm -hmm. enough to really make a name for myself. And that wasn't my uh, attempt. I was just trying to actually share mm -hmm. what I was finding. And it just uh, came across, you know, very logically. Okay, so it wasn't really necessarily Bigfoot, it was just other paranormal things. Well, I started with the Yeti and naturally went into Bigfoot. And then Loch Ness Monster and other cryptids came along because I, I saw similarity. It was uh, really, all these people were looking for new species. And that mm -hmm. was quite exciting to me because I had grown up thinking I was going to become a zoologist. And it turned out to be a cryptozoologist. Now, you were around doing stuff before the Patterson-Gimlin film debuted, was unleashed on the world. Right. Tell us, because we weren't, I wasn't there, I wasn't born yet. Uh -huh. What was the impact on, that you perceived on the scientific community, the paranormal community? Was that when Bigfooting really took off or was it, you know, because of the footprints by uh, Ray Wallace? What was the big? Well, Ray Roll Wallace was really years and years later. It wasn't part of what was going on. Okay. So the impact was immediately People were very excited they could actually see a piece of film and that film really brought together a lot of individuals that had been on the fringe. Uh, I was a correspondent of Ivan Sanderson so I was very aware of what was going on very early and uh, all of a sudden that academia part that always had been sort of separated from cryptozoology became merging so okay. that we were in the inside. We were in in school, some of us became professors, mm -hmm. and it really changed and became, uh, there was a, a time in there where we really felt that the film had been taken, within three years, the discovery was gonna be made. So if right. anything, it kind of- You were idealistic. I was. We all were, I, we all I, were. I mean, yeah. oh yes. uh, I mean, it's just, but the, then, 40 years later, people are still debating it and trying to debunk it exactly. and oh, there's a prolapsed vagina and there's nipples. Thank you, MK Davis. And then, oh wait, now there's the slaughter massacre alleged by MK Davis. Which Thank I you, actually MK Davis. wrote a whole, you know, counter rebuttal to because the whole massacre, those kinds of It's ridiculous. Side it's pareidolia. You're, you're seeing shadows and things that aren't really there. Analyzing an old... Okay. okay. Well, actually, the other thing... Ivan T Sanderson, who was really my, uh, my model, and I was his mentor, mentoree, uh, he really said never use one unknown to explain another unknown. And I think Thank that's you. what Thank occurred you. with a lot of the woo-woo faction. They got so frustrated that mm -hmm. a discovery wasn't made, so it had to be fourth dimensional. It had to, you know, the Eric Beck Jordans came along. And it had to be some other solution because we weren't finding a body right away. We weren't discovering something that could mm -hmm. be put in a zoo. So that trend happens in all of the cryptid fields because you have frustration. But as I point out a lot of times when I've talked to sort of the straight media, you actually have to have more patience. It took 65 mm -hmm. years for the giant panda, the mountain gorilla to be discovered. And that was in a time when people were sending out expeditions well-funded. Right now, it's a lot of six-pack Joes, it's a lot of weekend excursions, it's a lot of, you know, seeing <laughs> We're gonna look for Bigfoot. <laughs> Here's Bigfoot shit, and I got it in my hand. Or I'm a Bigfoot expert, and what I don't know, I make up. Yeah, there's been, has there been a, a, a surgence of that? Well, Ivan told me one time in 1965 that I was one of five people in the country seriously studying. If you look around now, there's literally thousands of people. Uh, I get 500 emails a day and you know, everything mm -hmm. from a kid saying I'm doing a report, send me everything you can on Bigfoot, to uh, people that have experiences that may be very serious experiences and they want a lightning rod kind of person to be, somebody to believe them. And, and so it gets very frustrating because there's so many people and they're trying to do anything they can to get evidence. Uh, some of which is good, but most of it's bad. Back on the Patterson Gilman, we were talking about how people are like seeing things that aren't there, that she's, you know, got a prolapsed vagina, uh, that it's a, it's a hoax, it's a man in a suit. There's only two things. It could be either a hoax or it's 
the real thing. What's the easiest explanation? It's a hoax. However, back in the 60s... It could also be a misidentification. Well, it doesn't look like a bear. No, but I'm talking about, in general, you pull yourself away from the Patterson film, and it could be somebody, uh, you know, it could be your grandmother in a fur coat. I mean, it could be somebody that was doing something way beyond what we think they were doing. Okay, now let's look at Roger Patterson. He had a little bit of a shady past. Well, not any more than any of us. Well, it's just that you take one person doing a book on him that does a lot of character assassinations. How do, how, how do you get your information that he had a shady past from one book that's been blown up into a lot of websites? Because nobody... Because well, Tom <laughs> told me that um, he uh, was arrested for stealing a camera. That was a rental camera that he did not turn in on time mm -hmm. and a summons was put out. He was never arrested. That's, that's the crazy. kind of things that happens in the modern days of blogs. Mm. Is people take one incident and blow it up into this person's a criminal. Right. It's, it's just not true. So Roger Patterson then, was, was he a standing citizen of the community? He what? was a rodeo writer. He was an in entertainer. He wanted to do a documentary film. He was interested in that. He was out taking background footage mm -hmm. when all of a sudden this Bigfoot walks into frame. He's not going to not take pictures of it. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens over and over again is the sensationalism of today is projected back into the 1960s. And it just is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, you know, going to go, he's dead, but I'm not right. going to go to court for him. But I'd go to court for Bob Gimlin, who also you know, had different things happen in his past because it just happens. People right. associate one minor incident and they blow it up into criminal activity. Why is the question of which horse Bob and Roger were riding always prevailing today? People keep asking him, well, what was the name of your horse? What was the name of Roger's horse? Because that happened when we interviewed Bob Gimlin. Yeah. So what's the big deal with that? I think everybody's looking for ma the minutia. Uh, there's stories, for instance, that Roger Patterson was a very short man mm -hmm. and he was on a Welsh pony, which are very short. And part of the story that everybody knew about before, uh, you know, asking Bob all of these questions is that Roger fell off his horse. Well, did he fall off a pony? Did he fall off a horse? No, was not one of those? Okay, there was one of those horses belonged to Bob Hieronymus. And Bob Hieronymus claims to be the man in the suit. He does, and he said he did it for a thousand dollars, and he wanted a thousand dollars more from, uh, you know, Fox News to tell a story. So the man has a connection here to money in his mind. And he happened to be Bob Gimlin's neighbor at the time. Right, right. And so he knows the story, and he's had forty years to practice the walk. But when he was eighteen years old, he was a basketball player, very thin, and he probably could not have looked that way. Nowadays, he's got a beer belly. And he walks like this in the suit, so of course he's going to look like the right. Bigfoot. Yeah. What do you See, think? I, do you I, think it's a man in the suit, Tammy? I don't know. Or a woman in a suit, since she has breasts. Well, and they were perky, but they may have been on the upswing. Well, they, they actually, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the cool they thing. swang I mean. a lot. They, they, <laughs> there was a swing to them. The other thing about the film, if you look at the film, and you don't even need to do MK analysis, you look at the legs, and the muscles actually tense up when mm -hmm. she's walking. I've seen that, yeah. That is hard to replicate in a costume. Well, look, and the, the head, the head slopes. If you, I mean, yeah. we have a forehead that's, you know, predominant here. Right. That thing's forehead which kind of goes like that. Right. And, and back in those days, everybody talks about, you know, Rick Baker and, uh, you know, John Chambers. Mm. John Chambers got a, an Academy Award for Planet of the Apes. But the Planet of the Apes costume started here. They, they just Hear that, people? Planet of the Apes costume started here. <laughs> what? I wasn't touching them. <laughs> this is definitely <laughs> Those are actually kind of patty size. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> what? We need to do this for analysis. MK Davis, this is how you really look at breasts. Okay, zooming in on Patty's... There. What? <laughs> I already did the naked thing for Bill Munn, so... Oh, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patterson Gimlin film you think is real? No, I didn't say that. You never asked me that question. What do you think it is? I think that I'm very careful about the use of the word believe. Belief means that you're very religiously involved in this. Mm -hmm. It's faith-based. 
that well, the way I look at the evidence is I accept it or deny it. So in terms of the Patterson film, I'd say I'm probably 95 percent inclined pretty, right inclined pretty certain that it's authentic but there's always five percent well questions. here's and here's what i tell people we weren't there we weren't there mm -hmm. and all we have now is fortunately one man's word still to this day and bob gilman has wonderful character and very very good credibility so right you, you know so you take that into that. account yes right you know but if he was fooled then his credibility he had a real experience Mm -hmm. What was that real experience? Right. That's the whole question. Do you have any questions, Tammy? Well, I came away from our interview last year at Beachfoot um, thinking that Bob Gimlin was genuine and that if there was a hoax in this film, that he was not involved. That's yeah. what I came away feeling. Well, one of the things that I think we really have to do in terms of Bigfoot research is move away from the Patterson film, the Patterson Gimlin film. It's time to really understand that's a historical document. You can't go back there unless you know one of you two invent a time mm. machine. Right. Uh, but it's really not helping us to do these in-depth analyses of every piece of the body and all of that, or try to overanalyze Bob Gimlin too much now. Mm. It's an old document. It's it's a piece of evidence. We need to put people out there. We need to fund them. We need to you know is whatever technology will work. And it's a starting point, but we need to really evolve beyond that. Uh, and what I'm seeing happening instead is Bigfoot is becoming a social phenomenon. It's become Bigfoot tourism. It's becoming a, a form of ecotourism that I'm not against, but people have to really realize and acknowledge that this is not research. You know, that what people are doing are having fun, they used to be talking about dinosaurs, or they used to go out birding. Now it's going out bigfooting. That doesn't mean there's going to be any evidence that's not. And they bring their dogs, which I love dogs. It's not an anti-dog statement, but dogs and bigfoot don't mix too well. They don't get along too well. No. And so you, uh, I actually supported a woman who went out in the woods for six weeks, and we, you know, got her equipment. We did all of that. She did an uplink. Uh, the first thing that happened when I saw her uplink is she had a dog with her. Yeah. And why did she have a dog? Because she was scared to be alone in the woods. Uh, so you bring six women and not a dog and yourself. But so there's little things like that. We just need to keep going in that direction, more like we're in Africa or Asia, mm -hmm. and really look at it away from the social phenomena. I agree. I agree. Oh, okay. What do you think of um, what... Bob and Kathy Strain are doing to try and get a Bigfoot body in Southeast Oklahoma area. I, I'm very clear. I've been anti-kill since the beginning. It's uh, there's many other ways to get a body. Yeah. You well, Bob Bob said in his interview that's the last um, thing to do is to kill. It's just do everything you can first and foremost before you drag back yeah, a body. but I wouldn't even do the last thing. You don't need to kill it. You you live capture. You find a dead body, you do whatever you can. There's, we don't know how many there are. We may be killing one of the last males or females. We, and it, it's probably, you know, in a certain area. And there are probably these little populations around the country. There's not, I mean, there's, there's only 350 so mountain gorillas. You don't go out and kill them just to prove that, you know, there's a mountain gorilla anymore. That's no, but, but, very Victorian mentality. But the flip side of that argument is if you get, if you kill a Sasquatch and you bring back the body for scientific analysis and science can't poo-poo it now, then you can fight to have it protected as an endangered species, create legislation. I mean, isn't there a state up here that says, you know, you pay a fine if you shoot and kill a Bigfoot? Was it in Washington? Washington. Right. It was in one county and that was uh, a temporary thing that happened in 1969 and it's expired a long time ago. Oh, it's so it's next. open season. Uh, run, Patty, run! <laughs> <Right>. <laughs>
Hey, my little Squatch Monsters, it's time to shake up the Bigfoot community. This is Off the Richter. I hate to bring it up, but there does seem to be a connection to UFOs. Bigfoot's invisible? Yet they're invisible. Did he just say Bigfoot's invisible? Yet they're invisible. No one's gonna take you seriously. We know for a fact that squirrels can't cloak. Oh God, here we go. Make sure your chairs are raised and tray tables locked in the upright position. If Roger Patterson were alive, he would be kicking your ass. Put down the bong and prove me wrong. God, why am I always having to tell this to you Bigfooters? You want your Bigfoot video to be seen? Now's your chance. How can you look for Bigfoot with all this marijuana smoke? Ugh. Hey, I'm Richter. I'm Bigfoot OG. 